Good afternoon, everyone. We want to see this afternoon that it really does matter what we believe and that we're not in a position to choose for ourselves what we are to believe. And God dictates that to please him, we have to believe the teaching of Jesus in his word, the Bible. So we want first to look at God, examples of God dealing with people to see that there are standards and principles that have to be upheld for worship to be acceptable with God. So please can we turn first to the book of Genesis, Genesis in chapter 4, very early on in the history of mankind on the earth, Adam and Eve have been expelled from the Garden of Eden and their two sons are bringing offerings to the Lord God. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 3. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. But unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lies at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So Cain and Abel then bring their offerings to the Lord God. Abel's is accepted, and Cain's is not. God doesn't thank Cain for his offering and say, yeah, it will do. Instead, verse 7, God says, if you do well, you will be accepted. So Cain had known that God wanted an animal sacrifice, but he still chose to do things his own way. He brought uh, some of his crops, and this was not acceptable with God. If we turn on, please, to the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10, and this is shortly after the nation of Israel come out of the land of Egypt and we're going to read about some of the early priests so Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 1 and Nadab and Abihu the sons of Aaron took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord which he commanded them not and there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. So Nadab and Abihu are the sons of Aaron, they're priests, to help the, the nation of Israel worship before the Lord God, and they bring incense to offer as a sweet smell to the Lord God. But instead of bringing the blend that God asked for in the law, they bring a concoction of their own. And again, like Cain, this is, was not acceptable to God. And here, the punishment was heavier, wasn't it? They paid with their lives. So we're being shown then that God is much greater than all of us. And if we want to please him, we have to do things the way God asks us to. Can we turn on to the first book of Samuel, please? In chapter 15... I'm going to look here at the first king of Israel, King Saul. And a mission, a very clear mission that God gives to him and see how he does at performing God's mission. So 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. So Saul then is given a very clear mission by the Lord God to go out to fight with Amalek and to destroy all the people and all their livestock so how did Saul get on let's have a look at verse 9 
So verse 8, this described how he destroyed the people, apart from the king. And verse 9, Saul and the people spared Agag, the king, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. So Saul did much of the killing that the Lord God required, but he saved the king alive, and he saved the best of the livestock. Samuel the prophet is then sent by God to speak to Saul. And we'll just have a look at verse 15. And this is Saul's first answer to, to Samuel. And Saul said, They, the people, have brought them from the Am Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. So here is Saul's justification for what he's done. Perhaps he feels under pressure. And he says the animals have been saved to be given as sacrifices. Like Abel did in, in our first reference. And let's come down to verse 22. This is the final answer from the Lord God to Samuel on this situation. Verse 22. And Samuel said... Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. So it's such an important lesson for us to remember that obedience to the Lord God is vital. And is very pleasing to God. So if God asks for standards in how we live our lives. And the things we believe. We need to take notice of God and of his word. Can we turn back please to the, the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy in chapter 10. Deuteronomy is the message from the Lord God. To Moses to give to the people of Israel the younger generation of Israel who are going to go into the promised land with Joshua after the death of Moses so he's, he's given them lots of advice on how they need to live and behave Deuteronomy 10 verse 12 and now Israel what does the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God to walk in all his ways and to love him to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul to keep the commandments of the Lord so Israel were told and we have to follow the same, same example to fear God and to walk in his ways fear here means respect or reverence we have to realise how great the Lord God is and try and serve him the way that he wants us to to walk in his ways is the same idea of obedience as we saw in, from Saul's day in, in 1 Samuel 15 so it's very important for us to have the right attitude and approach to pleasing God can we turn on to the book, Prophecy of Isaiah, please? Isaiah chapter 66. See, a, a principle here that the Lord God makes to his people. His, his people at the time of Isaiah were fluctuating very badly between trying to sometimes do what God wanted and then go off and completely do their own thing. And let's have a look at the guidance of Isaiah 66 and verse 1. Thus says the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me, and where is the place of my rest? For all those things is mine hand made, and all those things have been, says the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor, and of a contrite spirit, and trembles at my word. So we're shown the greatness of the Lord God in verse 1 there. He's the creator of all the world we see around us. But verse 2, God respects those that tremble at his word. That they respect it and treat it as a treasure. So we mustn't think that we can change God's word. God's word has to be respected and, and treasured by us. So we've seen in the Old Testament so far this very clear principle that God demands he be followed in the right way or not at all. Well, are the, is the same idea true in the New Testament? Well, can we turn, please, first to the letter of Paul to the Galatians, 
Galatians and chapter 1. So Galatia is a region with quite a few churches in that Paul visited on his, his first and second missionary journeys. <clears throat> and he's between visiting them, he, he's writing this letter because he's heard they have problems. And, and he's trying to deal with one of the problems in these verses that we're going to look at here. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So Paul then is speaking to these churches, he's visited in Galatia, modern day Turkey. He's warning them very strongly not to move away from the gospel. The gospel means good news and is the teaching of Jesus and his disciples like Paul about the kingdom of God and the role of Jesus in, in the purpose of God. Paul says they, they are to stay with the gospel Paul has taught them and not let anyone else persuade them to change that gospel. All the gospel taught by Paul and by Jesus and the disciples is included in the Bible that we have in front of us this afternoon. So that's all we need to read to understand the gospel. Can we turn back to have a look at Mark chapter 16 please? See words of the Lord Jesus on this subject. So these are the words Jesus left with his disciples shortly before he was received up into heaven. So this is a mission for them like the Lord God gave a mission to Saul that we saw earlier. Mark chapter 16 verse 15. Verse 15, he said unto them, the disciples, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptised shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned or condemned. So Jesus then gives the disciples this mission to spread the gospel to all the people that they are, they are to meet. But we can see in verse 16 for us, if we believe this gospel, it can lead to us being saved. And we can also note this mention of baptism in verse 16 that along with belief can save us. And we'll, we'll come back to this idea later on. So let's please turn on to the, the book of the Acts, Acts chapter 2. This is the first main occasion when the disciples carried out this instruction of Jesus in, in Mark chapter 16 on, on the day of Pentecost to a massive crowd in Jerusalem. And we just want to have a look at what it says about the results of this preaching on the day of Pentecost and the people who responded to that preaching. So Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. So verse 41 talks about 3,000 souls or people being added to the, ch the church in Jerusalem. Verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So this is a large group of people, 3,000 or more, many of whom have only recently come to believe the gospel and to be baptised. And going forward then, they use these four things in verse 42 to help them stay together and stay strong in their faith or, or their belief. The first one of those was the apostles' doctrine, then fellowship or meeting together, then the breaking of bread and then prayers. So we have to see the importance again of this first of these four, the apostles' doctrine or their teaching. They were not to move away from this, but continue to hold on to their shared understanding of the gospel. Please can we turn on to another letter of Paul, this time Ephesians. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4. So this is to the, the church or the ecclesia at Ephesus. And let's see what Paul has to say to, to the believers there on, on how they need to behave or what they need to understand. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. 
one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. And we can see the emphasis Paul puts in these verses on the number one. So there are not a variety of options for us to choose from. Verse four, there's one hope of our calling. Hope is a thing that we believe that we must hold on to, as we, we thought on this morning, we must grasp and seize it and not let it go. Verse five, there's one faith. There's one set of beliefs that we can put our hopes in that can lead to us being saved. And can we turn on to the last book of the Bible, please? Book of Revelation, chapter 22. And the closing remarks of the Lord Jesus in Revelation 22. So he gave this message to John. And let's have a look at Revelation 22 and verse 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the book the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. So these verses are very clear, aren't they? God's word doesn't change. We mustn't listen to people who want to say we don't have to believe all the gospel or we can choose one part and ignore another. <clears throat> or that there's something new for us to believe. All that we need to understand has been recorded already in the word of God. That's enough and sufficient for us to understand the purpose of God and what the true gospel is. The gospel is still true and, and doesn't need to be modernised at all no matter what people around us may think. So please can we turn to the passage we had for our reading, the second book of Kings in chapter 5, <clears throat> and to think about Naaman and his life, and this situation that happened to him. 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 1. 2 Kings 5 verse 1 Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honourable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valour, but he was a leper. So Naaman is at the centre of this, a very important and successful army man. But he was a leper, he had a dreadful skin disease, which could disfigure his face, I mean his life would become very difficult. So we had that, we've read with Brother Chris, the, the exchange of letters and visits until eventually Naaman gets sent to Elisha the prophet. So let's come down to verse 10. And Naaman is standing outside the door of Elisha, verse 9. Verse 10, Elisha sent a messenger unto him saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. So as we said, Naaman has found out that God may be able to help him with this dreadful disease. He's come to see Elisha, and we see how Elisha's message is very clear on how Naaman can be cleansed, can be cured of his disease, to go and dip in Jordan seven times. So, let's see Naaman's reaction. Verse 11, Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpa, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. So Naaman's reaction is quite strong, isn't it? He's not at all happy with Elisha's message presumably he wanted to see Elisha rather than just have a messenger come out to him and, and tell him what he needed to do and he's not happy at all with the message either he thinks he's better ways either for Elisha to cure him right there and then on the spot or for him to wash in cleaner waters in his own country we have to notice that at no stage in this discussion does God or Elisha say that's your name and you know that will do you, we can do it your way there is only one way ever offered for him to be cured. And let's come down to verse 14. After his servants have encouraged him to think about what he's been asked to do. Verse 14. 
Then went he, Naaman, down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So Naaman accepts that if he wants to be cured, he will have to do what Elisha said. And when he does, he washes seven times in Jordan, he is totally cured. So let's think then about what this represents, what leprosy represents and what the washing in Jordan represents. Please can we turn on please to the book of Isaiah again, this time Isaiah chapter 1. <clears throat> Here Isaiah is trying to wake the people of Israel or Judah up to realise the situation they're in. They need to change to please God or they're in a, a dreadful situation. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 6. This idea of the leprosy that Naaman had. Verse 6. From the sole of the foot even unto the head there is no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire, your land strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. So verse 6 then describes a very sick person with all these dreadful ailments of their skin, symptoms of leprosy. And verse 7 shows us that God is saying this, verse 6 describes a nation. So let's come down to verse 18 where God explains these things to his people. Verse 18, Isaiah through the Lord God says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. So these sores then in, in verse 6 represent sins in verse 18. And sins are things we have done to disobey or, or displease God. But verse 18, God offers Israel the chance for these red sores to be cleansed, to be made white and healthy. Um, but just as we saw with Saul, they have to be obedient. Verse 19, they have to be obedient. So, like Israel then, we all have sins for the times when we disobey or displease God and choose our own way instead of the way that God lays down for us. We all need to be cured of our sins, of our leprosy. What way does God offer us to have our sins cleansed? Well, please can we turn to the book of Acts again, Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> and these words that we're going to read probably provoked the massive response that we saw in verse 41 and 42 where 3,000 decided to, to follow the gospel. So let's have a look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. So Peter in, in his talk has been describing the importance of the Lord Jesus in the purpose of God and his death that's just happened. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, the crowd... They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptised every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the way for us to get God's help, like Naaman did, is to repent and to be baptised. Repent means to turn around or to change our way of thinking. The change from putting ourselves first in all that we do, which is our natural way of behaving, to trying to put pleasing God first and to do the things that God asks of us. Baptism is going underwater with our whole body, being submerged, like Naaman did in, in the River Jordan. And verse 38 talks about remission. Remission means pardon or freedom. Our sins, like Naaman's sores, can be totally washed away and forgotten. So if, like Naaman, we want to be cured, we have to follow God's ways and commands. We cannot find our own way to do it. So how do we follow God's ways and commands? Well, obviously, we have to read the Bible for ourselves. Please can we turn for our, our last reference to the Psalms. Psalm 119. <clears throat> We're going to see the, the attitude of 
David and his approach to life and, and the, the, the part that he had for the word of God in his life. So Psalm 119, verse 105. He says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So the Bible then can be our guide, just like David's, through life. It can show us the way we should go. But we have to keep on using it so that we can keep being guided by it. So it really matters what we believe, but we have to follow God's word and not man's. But don't just take my word for it. Please take God's word for it. It's really important that we all pick up God's word, the Bible, and find out for ourselves about God's marvellous plan for the world and how we can have a part in it.